Hello, everyone, and welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where in the world you are. I'm Bridget McNulty, and I have been living with type 1 diabetes for the past 14 years. Um, I'm a diabetes advocate, a member of the Blue Circle Voices, and the co-founder of Sweet Life Diabetes Community, which is South Africa's largest online diabetes community. I'm also really passionate about diabetes targets. I don't know how many of you know this, but diabetes is the number one killer of women in South Africa and the second leading cause of death in men, which is terrifying statistics, particularly considering that it's a manageable condition, as we all know. But it's not the first time that South Africa has been faced with what feels like an out of control health condition. If you remember the early to mid 2000s, HIV was the top killer in South Africa. And then UN AIDS brought in HIV targets. They brought them in in 2013 for 2020, and they were very ambitious targets, 90, 90, 90. So they wanted 90% of people with HIV to be diagnosed, 90% of those diagnosed to be on treatment, and 90% of those on treatment to be virally suppressed. What happened is that these targets really focused countries on HIV, and they worked so well that they're now on 95, 95, 95. I am very jealous. Luckily, today we have literally the best people here to discuss the topic of diabetes targets. And I'm so excited to introduce them to you. Before we dive in there, I have a, a few quick housekeeping notes. If we could go to the next slide, please. And the one after that, thanks for the housekeeping notes. So as you can see, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will send you a recording in the next few days. You can activate Zoom generated subtitles if you would like to, um, the closed captions. There's a closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom window. They are auto-generated, so they're not 100% accurate, but they can be helpful. And you can choose to switch them on or off. Uh, the recording and the slides and a feedback questionnaire will be sent to you in the next couple of days. And participants who attend the event live will get a certificate of attendance. Most importantly, please use the Q&A function to post any questions you have to our speakers and panelists. So as I can see, there is over 400 people here and everyone's introducing themselves. It's so exciting seeing all the different countries everyone's from. But if you have any specific questions that you wanna ask our speakers or our panelists, please don't use the chat, use the Q&A box. Um, and I'll keep reminding you to do that. And now let's get started. I am so excited to introduce our first uh, speaker to you. It is Prof. Stephen Collegiori, who is the IDF Vice President, and he is gonna be setting the scene for us. Over to you, Stephen. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much. And it's a pleasure to be here representing the International Diabetes Federation at this important webinar. Uh, to discuss the proposed voluntary WHO diabetes targets. So for the past uh, 20 years, the IDF has regularly produced uh, an IDF atlas. And the last of these, the 10th edition, was published late last year and reported that there were an estimated 537 million adults aged 20 to 79 with diabetes. And this equated to one in 10 people in this age group. Considered by IDF region, the largest numbers are found in the Western Pacific and the Southeast Asian region, and these uh, reflect the large populations of China and India. But in terms of prevalence, the largest uh, numbers are in the Middle East and North Africa region, where one in six individuals has uh, diabetes, and in the North America and Caribbean region, where one in seven people has diabetes. The first atlas uh, published in 2000 estimated that there were 151 million people with diabetes, and this has increased to 537 over the 21 years. And that uh, means that there's nearly 400 million more people with diabetes than there was in 2000. The 2003 atlas uh, predicted that in 2021, there would be 333 million people with diabetes and the actual numbers are 200 million more than this. A significant proportion of people with 
sorry, a significant proportion of people with uh, diabetes are undiagnosed, uh, some 45% overall, but in the African region, the Western Pacific region and the South East Asia region, there are more than 50% who are undiagnosed and the lowest proportion, less than 25% is in the North America and uh, Caribbean region. Now, in addition to the people with diabetes, there are some 860 million people who are at high risk of developing diabetes. These include 540 million with impaired glucose tolerance and 319 million people who have impaired fasting glucose. Now, there are a number of reasons why there has been this increase in the number of people with diabetes, and they're not necessarily all bad. So for example, there has been an increase in the world population. So in the age group of 20 to 79, over the last eight years, there are, a more, there are 0.5 billion people more in this age group. Also in general, life expectancy has increased and this also applies to people with diabetes. So people with diabetes are living longer. Also, there seems to have been a shift in the percentage of people with undiagnosed diabetes so between 2017 and uh, 2021, uh, about 5% less people with undiagnosed diabetes. And I mentioned these are good reasons for the numbers increasing. But the biggest driver of the increase in numbers are, are new people developing diabetes, which probably accounts for about 80% of the increase. But even here, the news is not all that bad. So the 2021 Atlas for the first time reported incidence of diabetes, so the number of new people developing diabetes. And uh, the incidence of uh, type 2 diabetes is either falling or stable in many high income countries. So, for example, at the top of this graph, you can see data from the US in which the incidence uh, or number of new diabetes has increased, but then has fallen. And this is repeated for many countries from about 2010. There are some exceptions such as Canada and, and Singapore in the middle. Now, this is possibly due to the success of prevention strategies implemented in many countries, but it uh, may also be influenced by other factors such as the ratio of diagnosed to undiagnosed people. Now, the situation with type one diabetes is that there is an estimated 1.2 million uh, children and adolescents up to the age of uh, 20 who have type one diabetes and approximately 150,000 uh, children in this age group are developing diabetes uh, each year. And unlike type 2 diabetes, the incidence of type 1 diabetes is increasing, not decreasing. There's also the challenge of hyperglycemia in pregnancy and approximately 16.5% of pregnancies each year that result in a live birth, some 21 million pregnancies are associated with some form of hyperglycemia in pregnancy, most commonly gestational diabetes. So if we turn now to diabetes care, there are three main focuses in terms of reducing the burden and that is preventing people developing diabetes, the early detection of undiagnosed diabetes and improving the care of people who have diagnosed diabetes all with the aim of preventing or delaying the complications of diabetes, the micro and macrovascular complications that we're all familiar with. With regard to diabetes care, there are three main domains which relate to processes of care, like uh, having regular examinations, having availability of essential medicines, intermediate outcomes such as control of HbA1c, blood pressure and lipids, and the long-term outcomes, the complications that I mentioned and also premature mortality. Now it's well known that care is suboptimal for people with diabetes, even in well-resourced health systems. And even in these well-resourced health systems, the individual intermediate outcome targets are achieved in only 50 to 70%, and only about 20% of people with diabetes meet all recommended targets. And the situation is worse in people living in low and middle income countries. So when it comes to um, considering or trying to summarize the situation with diabetes care, 
we often refer to the diabetes rule of halves. So if you take all people with diabetes, approximately half of those are actually diagnosed. For the people who are diagnosed, only half of those received recognized processes of care, like actually having a regular examination, measurement of HbA1c, and only half of those actually achieve the treatment targets. So clearly, there is a big challenge in trying to increase these numbers to reach levels that will actually impact diabetes care. And as mentioned by Bridget already, targets are an extremely important and essential element in improving care and achieving outcomes. So in, in summary then, I think the key messages for this introductory talk are that I think we'd all agree that diabetes is a major and increasing global challenge, and it's actually been made much worse by the uh, COVID epidemic, pandemic, which is still with us. Targets are essential for setting goals and for guiding the interventions for reducing the diabetes burden and improving outcomes. But it doesn't stop there. There are some other important components, such as developing and implementing strategies to achieve the targets, and also the regular monitoring and reporting on the progress in achieving targets. And I'm sure that we're going to hear more about this during the course of this meeting. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Kalyajiri. That is fascinating. The numbers are staggering, aren't they? And I agree with you that the targets are one essential step because they focus us on, on what is really necessary and hopefully get countries to prioritize diabetes. Next up, we have a fascinating talk from Dr. Bente Nicholson. She is the director of the WHO NCDs division and will be speaking to us about diabetes in the global agenda accelerating progress towards 2030. Over to you, Dr. Mickelson. Thank you very much. And first of all, I want to warmly congratulate IDF. Uh, you know, we have been able to do together uh, real acceleration in the awareness and interest for diabetes in WHO and through WHO the last two years. But you have been really pushing this hard for years. And the atlas that you have been providing, all the figures that you showed now, is absolutely essential. So uh, good morning, good evening, and uh, good day to all of you. And I'll just uh, tell you a little bit of what the WHO is doing. So if you give me the first slide, please. So you might know that we have been able, as I said, to accelerate the engagement for diabetes in the last two years. And the way we are doing this and the aim for this is of course to accelerate the progress towards 2030 in all countries. Next slide, please. So we launched the Global Diabetes Compact and this was really something coming from the constituencies like IDF, like UDF and all the people, WDF, all the colleagues and friends you know online but also the people living with diabetes and the healthcare workers uh, together. So what you see here is the aim of the Global Diabetes Compact that was launched on the 14th of uh, April in last year on the uh, day of the discovery of insulin in a summit that many of you probably also followed. And it is to reduce the risk of diabetes and also to ensure that all people who have diagnosed, uh, who are diagnosed with diabetes have access to quality management. Next slide, please. And here you see uh, some pieces of the journey. And they started actually then with the launch, the summit. It went through uh, the World Health Assembly already last year for the resolution on diabetes. And this is, uh, was and is still really a game changer. We have had dialogues with industry, with people living with, with stakeholders, with ex experts all over the world. And we have also established a Global Diabetes Compact Forum where you're all very uh, much invited to join. And we will put some links in the chat so you can see how you can join it. And of course, together with all you, the stakeholders, and we have also celebrated uh, the World Diabetes Days. 
And we have worked with our uh, colleagues in the medicines and product department also uh, launching reports like uh, keeping the 100 years promise uh, after the 100 years of discovery of insulin. And I don't know if you said that, but I think you did, Stephen, very clearly that, you know, we are talking about an innovation and uh, 100 years after a big innovation, still only approximately 50% of those in need is benefiting. So how can that be? It's absolutely immoral. So this year we have been through the executive board meeting from the, in WHO, and there will be a discussion on this item during next week in the World Health Assembly. Next slide, please. So uh, for those of you who have followed the work, you will see that the compact has several work streams. And I'm very happy that you emphasized, Stephen, on uh, that targets is not, uh, is not enough. And also very uh, encouraging to hear you say that probably some of the positive development is because of prevention, health promotion, and I guess included health literacy and empowerment of people. So you see, we have tried to cover the whole thing. So it's about access to medicines, technical products, normative products that will be developed by WHO, and also very importantly, country support. And we are really looking for funding to support countries. And I can mention that we just came out of an international strategic dialogue in Accra, Ghana, convened by the president of Ghana and the prime minister of Norway, and they had a national round table. And it was amazing and also very sad, of course, to listen to the national uh, round table and how much sorrow and uh, impact on health diabetes have in these countries. And it's growing as uh, Stephen said as well. It's also about research and innovation and also innovation to action. And it is about governance and really keeping this high on the strategic agenda. Next slide, please. So I just give you a couple of sort of uh, uh, examples, I think. So this is from the diabetes resolution, easy to find. I'm sure my colleagues will post it in the uh, chat as well. So what you can see here is that the member states really asked us, and this is uh, very much a pleasure for me to tell you, that uh, eventually, you know, the people suffering from NCD and especially diabetes during humanitarian emergencies are really getting the attention that they need. So we were asked to include also uninterrupted treatment of people living with diabetes in humanitarian emergency. Unfortunately, we already got a chance to prove this uh, because of the war in Ukraine. I will show that in the next slide. But we also were asked very specific um, uh, asks to WHO uh, to be able to improve access to all diabetes medicines and devices, as you can see in this slide. Next slide, please. So uh, on this work stream one, which is the access work stream, we have been working very hard together with lots of different stakeholders, but also following up on our mandate uh, on the private sector engagement. We have got commitments now for pre-qualification. We have got some funding for pool, pool procurement mechanisms. We are about to establish registers, forecasting, priority countries linked to uh, the work stream on supporting countries. So now something happened here. So maybe you could give me the slide again. Um, it was, I think we need to go quickly. Uh, thank you. And also we will be able to um, launch a cold chain integration uh, later this year to really benefit from all the new mechanisms we have seen for the vaccine uh, towards COVID. So this is just to give you a little bit of flair. I know this is not the topic of the meeting, but I couldn't uh, bear myself to also mention a couple of these things. Next slide will also show you that uh, we have been able to address uh, the humanitarian situation this time in Ukraine. And we are part of the day-to-day -day response and we are able to support people living with diabetes through our NCD emergency kit. So if you can move to... Yes, it's um, speeding up. <laughs> That's a good thing, right? 
So then um, maybe you can go one step back just to show the, oh, I'm sorry. Hold on a second, Dr. Bentley, sorry for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I just uh, keep on talking if you have a technical problem so we don't delay what you think. Uh, let's give it one more chance, right? Ah, oh, no, that doesn't really work. So, um, if you could while we're solving it, Dr. Mickleton, could I ask you, there's been a question um, in the Q&A for you. Yes. Which are the five priority countries for WHO and what are the cri criteria to prioritize them? There is, no the five, spot while we're... there is no five priority countries. You know, all the countries of WHO uh, is a priority. And what is happening in WHO is that every country are setting their own priorities and they are also asking for support from WHO. So we try our best to accommodate that support. So, of course, sometimes we can join forces in a more integrative uh, support to countries. So we have uh, five countries really having a long stand, stand commitment on integration, while we have other countries only working more through the lens of cancer, diabetes, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's really uh, up to the countries to flag their priorities. And since we are in this meeting, I wouldn't call it a family meeting, but because now we are 500 people, it's a huge family <laughs> at least, but you know, it's very much also uh, up to civil society and, and academia, other stakeholders to help and support the countries to be very sort of specific in their demands. This is a very important thing that we could learn. You were mentioning HIV. We can learn from uh, the work towards HIV. There is a need to support countries even to express their demands because it's not known and it's a typical situation when you don't have access to medicines, you don't have demand because it's not through no sort of trust in the system. So this is extremely important. If you can go to uh, two slides back, please. And I hope we are not, yes, this is working well. One more, even one more. Okay, um, we will be very happy to share all the slides. So, and if there is specific questions about emergency, Dr. Slim Slama is here and it is really due to him that we can offer this uh, support at the moment. So no, I will just go back to the real uh, focus on this meeting, and that is to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the development of the targets. So it was a big discussion during the World Health Assembly, uh, and eventually uh, you saw that we were asked as part of the recommendation to also come up with targets. And why uh, did the member states agree to this? Uh, it was, of course, because of figures that uh, Stephen was mentioning in the beginning and the new development and also the absolute lack of uh, achievement for the 30% reduction in premature mortality from non-communicable diseases and an understanding that diabetes is the most uh, rapidly increasing diseases and also unfortunately have an increase in premature mortality. So really an urgency, something had to be done. And it's also then because of the new commitments uh, coming through UHC that uh, all people should be covered by essential services through universal health coverage. We knew that we had a huge treatment gap and it was beautifully set out by, again, Stephen, and also a, a gap when it comes to diagnosis. And it was the strongest ask from all our experts and non-state actors and really echoed by the people living with, because there is a need to be able to speak together on some targets. We can speak about HPI and C, but it's not really speaking to people living with health care workers, maybe, but not policymakers. So um, next slide, please. So that was why we got this agreement. 
And we have done this as we always do in WHO and we have the experts on this call as well and in the panel. Uh, so we had a technical expert consultation, global web-based consultation to all stakeholders, UN agencies. We had consultation informally with pharmaceutical uh, industry. And we also had with civil society, academic institution, philanthropies, people living with, and then eventually we submitted a draft recommendation of the targets, and it was included in the executive board paper that you have already seen. So that brings us to May 2022. So next slide, please. And just for your information, of course, you know this, most of you, but what will happen next week is that it's the meeting of the 194 member states instead of only the 34. And we have been in constant dialogue with them. And I must say it that so far, we have seen uh, support. There has been some technical questions. We have answered them. And I think people are now very uh, happy, but uh, it remains, of course, to be seen. And we hope for uh, uh, an approval as expected next, next week. Next slide. And I think that's my last one. And that's, of course, the crucial ones. So this is the proposed uh, global di diabetes coverage targets. So you can see here that it is about the 80% of people uh, with diabetes are diagnosed. And we saw already that this is a need. It's also those diagnosed having a good control of uh, glycemia and uh, that uh, people uh, diagnosed also have good control of blood pressure. And it goes without saying that we are not thinking in silos, so of course, all our work on hypertension is as relevant uh, as it is uh, the other way around. So even if we present it like this, we know exactly that this has to come together in the primary health care and the strengthening of the primary health care and also secondary care, of course. Then the 60% of people with diabetes of 40 years of older receiving statins and 100% of people with type 1 diabetes have access to affordable insulin treatment and blood glucose self-monitoring. I think this is my last slide. I want to emphasize again, even these targets are not the end. It's actually part of the journey. And if we don't have a health system that can actually take care of the people living with and at risk of as well um, diabetes, these targets have no uh, meaning. But the targets is a very effective communication, apart from many other things, an effective way to communicate the real need and to cascade like this and really see the lack of coverage is a question that will be of huge interest to the member states as well. Very last, in the same World Health Assembly um, that is happening next week, you will also see that there is a presentation of an obesity acceleration plan. And I think Stephen mentioned this, uh, the link to obesity, of course. So you should also- I'm gonna interrupt you there, so space. sorry. Thank Dr. you. Nicholson, we're running out of time. Thank you yes, so much. Thank you. I mean, I could happily listen to you all day. And I do wanna say as a person with diabetes, we really appreciate how much WHO has been focusing on diabetes. And I'm gonna move straight on to our next speaker and just remind everyone that if you have any questions for our speakers or panelists, you can use the Q&A function, uh, not the chat function, the Q&A function at the bottom. I'd like to invite Dr. Leanne Riley, the head of the surveillance monitoring and reporting unit from the WHO to join us and tell us how they track progress on diabetes. Over to you, Dr. Riley. Thank you so much um, and good afternoon, good, uh, good evening, good morning, uh, colleagues. Um, already my colleagues have said so much in relation to what I wanted to cover, but I've been asked to really address a little bit around the kind of measurement, surveillance and monitoring of diabetes in this context. So, of course, it's hugely important, not just for communication and improvement of service, um, but we really feel that having targets helps us to clarify. And there's the age old saying, what gets measured gets done. So I want to really talk a little bit about um, how we're proposing um, and what the tools and systems are in place for measurement um, of diabetes in general, but of course, also these very strategic targets. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to start with giving you a little bit of a kind of context or framework for what we see as the key building blocks for, um, for diabetes surveillance across these five areas. 
Some are more linked to the specific targets, but I actually think all of these areas are important for having a comprehensive approach to understanding and acting on um, diabetes prevention and control. Uh, so next slide, please. And critical, of course, is for thinking through um, what are the real indicators or drivers that we need to be monitoring and measuring for progress in this area. Next slide, please. So if we're looking at these components, um, one that's not addressed by the targets but is really important is understanding what is the broader context for policy, governance, um, guidelines and infrastructure related to uh, diabetes prevention and control. And I've really just listed out a few of these here going to focus less on these. I know we're trying to make up perhaps a little bit of time. So that I that those supporting um, uh, domains are, are, are still critical for this area. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, um, very important in this context, and we've heard uh, so much about this already from, from the, the other two presenters, is looking at what is the health system um, capacity and availability. Because if we're going to be promoting um, getting more people diagnosed and treated, we need to make sure that these services and, um, and technologies and um, medicines are actually available in health services. So again, I've listed a few here, but these are a really critical underlying drivers for being able to report on the targets. Next slide, please. And this is where we start to see also how we may actually measure and report on some of these. Um, the, role, the key role in many cases for population-based data um, on diabetes and related risk factors, potentially born from population-based surveys where particularly in countries, and as we've heard about this disparity um, with low and middle income countries where it may not be through service availability data or service provision data, we're still trying to capture prevalence and diagnosis at the population level. So we need to look at not just health service data, but how we would be able to understand that. Um, and, and as we've seen with the targets, um, also relating to people, um, comorbidity for particularly um, hypertension here. Uh, next slide, please. And very critical, um, and speaking to some of the targets, uh, that is the area of actual program monitoring so that we're seeing among the people who have diabetes who are actually receiving pharmacological treatment, what is their control level and where are the complications related to, uh, to, to diabetes as well. So that program monitoring area, absolutely vital. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is that last domain is making sure that countries have a robust health information system that's actually capable of measuring and reporting across some of these very critical indicators. Um, next slide, please. And, and now I wanna just talk a little bit about some of the tools and, um, and mechanisms that need to be um, introduced, strengthened, supported in countries, because I know we've been seeing a lot of that in the chat as well. So first and foremost, we really need to make sure that we've got very robust standardized indicators and then the def definitions along with these data collection tools so that we are capable of measuring and reporting on these targets in, in countries. And not just these targets, but a lot of those associated indicators that really speak to um, improvements and performance of the system. So next slide, please. Um, this is just a, um, a, a brief snapshot. I'm not going to go into all of the detail um, of some of the WHO tools that we've got um, available or very soon forthcoming um, to promote the collection of data related to this area. So the first one, we're doing a um, capacity assessment to look at key informant studies about availability, mostly related to the governance and infrastructure and um, policies and strategies. The next couple really speak to tools that we have for helping capture population level um, data that speaks to um, who has uh, raised blood glucose or diabetes in the community, who's had a previous diagnosis, are they taking medicines, and, and then some of the related risk exposures. Um, the next area of, um, of tools are really looking to helping standardize 
um, and, and, and support what the metadata for these indicators around patient and program monitoring may be. Um, and then availability of medicines and technologies. Um, so we're really strengthening and developing that area to make sure that these can be um, more routinely reported in the future. And we haven't touched so much on it, but of course, morbidity, mortality um, is also um, important. We need to understand not just our lived experience, but also who's dying and can we do more to prevent that? We've had a mention of the um, the sustainable development goal related to premature NCD mortality and having strong systems in place to report on that is critical. So I know I have a couple more slides, but I just want to address one more and then I think we can skip them. I just uh, wanted to make a, a final plea then for the need um, for strengthening the health information systems in countries to be able to report on these very important um, targets and associated indicators. So um, we are really hoping countries will do everything they can to really um, strengthen the implementation of facility-based patient and program monitoring that's going to be critical for reporting against these targets, having strong civil and vital registration systems, but also continuing to conduct periodic population-based surveys so we can also capture the experience of people who may not be visiting health services um, to do that. And obviously we want to really encourage countries to do as much as they can to leverage existing tools or strengthen and develop them more um, to, to really start to capture the data that's needed um, for these extremely important uh, targets. And as I said at the outset, what gets measured gets done. So let's really have a plea for strength and measurement in this area. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna skip the, the last couple of slides. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Riley. That was fascinating. And for everyone who wishes they could have a closer look at your slides, I want to reassure you that um, the recording will be sent out to everyone in the next couple of days. You can press pause and read all of the data because it was absolutely fascinating. Um, and a reminder to use the Q&A if you have any questions for our panelists or for our roundtable. We are moving on to our roundtable next. So I would like to ask all the panelists um, to switch on your cameras. And just to let you know, the way we're going to be doing this is we're going to work through target by target and have a closer look at each of the targets. Our roundtable is made up of Mrs. Kazi Zebunessa Begum. She is the additional secretary for the Bangladesh Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Dr. Slim Slama, who is the unit head of NCD management screening, diagnosis, and treatment for WHO. Dr. Leanne Riley, the Head of the Surveillance, Monitoring and Reporting Unit at WHO. Professor Edward Gregg from the School of Public Health at Imperial College London. Prof. Joao Raposo from the Asociacio Protectora dos Diabeticos de Portugal. I'm sorry, I'm sure I, I did not pronounce that properly. And Ms. Emma Claitman, the Global Advocacy and Policy Manager for Life for a Child. Welcome to all our panelists. So the first target that we're going to be discussing is 80% of people with diabetes are diagnosed. Do we have any idea how many people living with diabetes are currently diagnosed? Uh, Prof. Greg, could you maybe give us some insight? Uh, sure. Um, as Professor Colagiri described, there's about 536 million people in the world with diabetes, or 536 million adults. And as far as we know, only about 400 million of them are diagnosed. So it's really close to half, depending on the estimates, about 45% are undiagnosed. Um, and I think as we're gonna talk about more, this is a big, a big concern that um, we think we can actually make a big difference in terms of long-term health if we can do something about this. Absolutely. One of the questions that came in on the Q&A earlier was, uh, if this target is across all types of diabetes, isn't that especially troublesome in type one diabetes? It effectively endorses a 20% serious morbidity and mortality rate due to non-diagnosis. Dr. Slama, I'm going to throw this one at you. And uh, I think we, we had that discussion around the selection and we can further dis discuss with the Ed as well and the expert when this was uh, developed. There was a um, different dimension when you um, carve those targets one dimension um, is really, I mean, the relevance and the impact in terms of outcome that can be measurable. Uh, but there was also a human right dimension specifically for type one uh, diabetes because it's a, it's a life and death issue. Uh, 
And actually, we have taken this into consideration. So those elements that were there were not just made like this. And I think for those of you who have had the chance to, to read the background paper, that was a very systematic approach. I mean, we can discuss, and this is always something that when um, the Secretariat and WHO proposed, I mean, those global targets, there was a national level, there was a global one, and there was a place for consultation. And those consultations happened before, I mean, uh, all last year, but also uh, ahead of the executive board. And it's really something that we carve as a, as a community, as a global community together. So I think, yes, we have taken into consideration that these 80%, some of the colleagues say, but for type one, we 100%. And this is why actually that fifth target in particular mentioned 100% for that dimension, because the other one are taking into consideration, uh, one, the impact, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, expected outcomes, but also the feasibility and the measurability that were the other criteria that were outlined in uh, in the background paper. We'll stop there perhaps and Thank Ed you. can further elaborate. Thank you, Dr. Slaman. Um, if we're looking specifically at, at one country, what is the percentage of diagnosed people in Bangladesh? Ms. Begum, could you speak to that? I think you're on mute. Oh, there you go. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, what is the percentage of people diagnosed with diabetes in Bangladesh? Oh, thank you very much. Actually, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank IDF for inviting me and give me the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, yes, actually, uh, we have, um, uh, according to IDF um, report on um, 2021, 57% of our estimated uh, cases are diagnosed. And still we have 43% undiagnosed cases. This is really very important and very alarming as well. South Africa is in a, in a similar situation, so I hear you. If we're looking at target two, 80% of people diagnosed have a good control of glycemia. Gosh, that's, that's a big question. How do we define good control? Of blood sugar. So that was one of the questions that came up in the Q&A. It's very dependent on the individual clinical context, age and comorbidity. So it's difficult to measure success at a population level. Prof Raposa, can I throw this one at you? Thank you for that difficult question, Bridget. <laughs> uh, I'll do my best. So that, that's one of the most important questions that we are keeping discussing in the scientific media of diabetes and even in the consultation daily, in a daily basis. What we know, and you just mentioned, that's very dependent on individual conditions, on the treatment, age, comorbidities, access to different treatments also, access to technology. So the context, as in as many other things, are really important. But we know for sure that imagine A1C levels above 8% for those countries that are using 8%, in my country we use the percentage, well, for sure, most of those people are not well controlled. So from a population perspective, we can easily choose 8% if you want to be very ambitious, 7.5%. Not, and we should be very cautious to telling people that that's not their individual target, but that's when we are analyzing the global population of a country, of a region, of a, a health facility, we don't want to have people above a certain level consider the 8% level, because those for sure are in poor control, or most of them are in poor control. And at least we should take care, uh, another look at those people. So it's not individual process, it's global population, and be sure to keep that message when taking care of the people. That's a very valuable distinction. Thank you, Prof. Raposa. If we look at the current percentage of people with diagnosed diabetes who have good glycemic control, do we know what that number is? Prof. Greg, do you have an idea for us? Sure. So, and, and I think um, Professor Raposo's point is key is that these are not clinical guidelines. These are population-based monitoring guidelines. And so the proportion that are meeting, the, the proportion that are meeting 8%, we think around the world is about two thirds, okay? However, if we were to use a, clinical guidelines that many countries use, which would be lower than 8%, it's actually much smaller than that. We chose 80% because we think it's both ambitious and achievable, and that if we can achieve that, then we're gonna really reduce the, the morbidity that follows from diabetes. 
I like that as a phrase, ambitious but achievable. It, it, it strikes the right kind of balance. Um, if we look to Bangladesh, um, Ms. Begum, does the Ministry of Health of Bangladesh know the percentage of people with good glycemic control? You're on mute, sorry. Ms. Begum? You're on mute. Sorry, uh, I couldn't hear actually because there was an interruption of uh, you know Wi-Fi here. So, uh, uh, does the so Ministry far... of Health of Bangladesh do they have the percentage of people with good glycemic control? Yes, um, we had a study in uh, 2018, a national level study on this uh, diabetes uh, things, and uh, uh, as part of that report, we have 13.6% of diagnosed cases under control. But it's really difficult uh, to, you know, continue or regular monitor whether the people are uh, under surveillance regularly and they are really, uh, you know, uh, they have changed their lifestyle and other habits. And this is something like not a disease, but uh, 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 um, uh, what should I say? Like uh, it's the factory of the disease. So uh, it, it's really need a long awareness, lot of uh, education, lot of uh, you know, regular uh, monitoring. Uh, but uh, uh, we have a uh, study and we know that 13.6% are under my Thank, Thank you. you for that. So if we look at target three, it's 80% of people diagnosed have a good control of blood pressure. How many people diagnosed with diabetes currently have good control of blood pressure? Prof. Greg? Sure. And the same disclaimer applies. This is not the clinical <laughs> guideline, but our monitoring guideline suggests that in this case, the situation is actually worse than it is for glycemic control. It's roughly half. Um, of people with diabetes have our target of 140 over 90. Um, so we have a long ways to go with this one as well. Hmm. And back to you, Ms. Begum, does the Ministry of Health of Bangladesh have the percentage of people with good blood pressure control? What did your study show? Uh, yes, um, the, the uh, answer is almost same because we have the similar same study. It, it says that uh, 14%, 14 plus actually, 14.1% have this blood control, blood pressure control. Uh, this is a government uh, you know, report. That is a, a strikingly similar percent, 13.6 and 14.1. And um, yeah. how can this target of 80% of people diagnosed having a good control of blood pressure, how can it improve the lives of people living with diabetes? I'm throwing this one back at you as well, Prof. Greg, but don't worry, we're going to give everyone else a turn soon. Sure. So, well, the nature of diabetes is, is it leads to many different conditions, of course, and blood pressure happens to be one of the fundamental roots that complications develop, whether it's retinopathy, stroke, heart disease, um, you know, acute complications, congestive heart failure. So if we can influence blood pressure, we influence that progression to many different conditions that result from diabetes. Great, thank you so much. I just wanted to um, focus a little bit more on, on the first two targets. So, so now we've looked at 80% of people with diabetes are diagnosed, 80% of people diagnosed have a good control of glycemia, and 80% of people diagnosed have a good control of blood pressure. I wanted to um, see if we could ask Ms. Clayton from uh, Life for a Child, if she'd like to contribute, particularly on the 80% of people with diabetes are, are diagnosed, what, do, what would you like to add? Em? Thank you, Bridget. And I hope you'll excuse me in, in my approach here. I'm gonna be really stripping back to basics here just because um, I think that's quite essential from a sort of living with um, type one diabetes and uh, an LMIC perspective. So I will be very blunt about this, at least from a type one diabetes perspective. It is so important. We feel that all people living with type one diabetes 
diabetes are diagnosed so that they can fulfill their rights to life and that they have good lives, actually. Misdiagnosis is very common in LMICs. It can even be as high as up to 50% in some countries, which, which is incredibly hard to fathom, but, but this is a reality in some settings. We have heard so many horror stories about misdiagnosis. We've heard of situations where young people living with undiagnosed diabetes come into hospital with all of the classic symptoms, but are being diagnosed <clears throat> excuse me, with ectopic pregnancy or malaria, and the list does go on. Um, and, and I think this is due to a lack of healthcare professional training, but I do believe this, this is changing for the better. But there are circumstances, I, I do want to say, where, you know, a, a type 1 diabetes diagnosis is achieved for a young person. And even in that circumstance, there will be immense challenges in both the short and long term if that diagnosis is delayed. A bad start has long lasting metabolic impacts on the body, yes, but there are also impacts I, I feel on unresolved trauma and this, this trauma can stand straight in the way of self empowerment, which I feel is a, a key ingredient to successful self management. And there are also so many physical complications that can arise due to a delayed diagnosis as well. Um, and I think, you know, if, Finally, even in circumstances where timely diagnoses are achieved, I, I do want to say to the community here that it should not just stop at diagnosis. A timely diagnosis is really just the tip of the iceberg here, so to speak. And, and when a family leaves the hospital after their diagnosis, it's a critical juncture in time and successful home management hinges on whether or not they feel as confident as they can in, in this sort of scary new time for them. And, and this is really where continued access to education plays such a fundamental role as children grow up and have different hormone fluctuations and environmental circumstances. Diagnosis, it's essential clearly, but families must leave hospitals after that diagnosis feeling confident to self-manage at home. And they have to be able to rely on this for the duration of their lives. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kateman. And, and that speaks also to um, the target two, which is that 80% of people diagnosed have a good control of their, their glycemia. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that before we move on to the other targets? Yes, and again, I'm going to go back to basics. And I, I think, you know, to even begin the conversation on enabling people living with diabetes, especially type one, to have good control of glycemia, they need to be given the chance to monitor their glycemia in the first place. I don't need to tell you all what happens when there isn't good control, but it's so, so common. And I am taking this back to basics because it is common that young people who can't afford strips are, are not testing their glucose for weeks and weeks at a time, or it could be that they have the supplies and they're not empowered to test um, and getting that education and empowerment from healthcare professionals. Thank you so much. We're getting an amazing amount of questions and thank you everyone. And we're, we're slotting them in as we go. Um, but I do want us to move forward because I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. So we've gone through the first three targets. We have much more to say about all of them, don't worry. But target four is that 60% of people with diabetes over 40 years or older should receive statins. Again, do we know how many people with diagnosed diabetes currently receive statins, Prof Greg? Sure, this is the one indicator that probably varies the most around the world. Um, there's not, and it also probably suffers from the least data. On the median, suggests that maybe 10 to 20 percent um, take statins uh, among people with diabetes, but that varies by country anywhere from, from 5 percent on up to 60 percent. Um, so that's why this target is a, is a, a bit lower because to try to be ambitious, but also realistic, we, we set a target that um, we felt that countries that are at five or 10 or 20% to achieve 60% would be very ambitious. And if they do it, it'll make a big difference on cardiovascular risk for people with diabetes. Great, thank you. So if we look at these first four targets, 
80% of people with diabetes diagnosed, 80% of those diagnosed have a good control of glycemia. 80% of those diagnosed have a good control of blood pressure and 60% of those with diabetes over 40 years or older receive statins. Why are these important to improve the lives of people living with diabetes? Um, Ms. Clayton, I'm gonna throw this one at you first. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, thank you, Bridget. Um, uh, I mean, you know, as I took it back to kind of that first point about even having access to um, glycemic management tools in the first place um, is because I think test strips are such a cornerstone and, and foundation for type one diabetes care. You know, insulin in my view for comparison's sake is like a television and test strips are like the remote. You can't use the TV if you don't have the remote, you can't change the channels, you can't even and turn on the TV. And I think it's clear that, you know, it's so, so, so clear. I don't need to say that insulin is the most essential medicine for a person living with type one diabetes, but without test strips, insulin can only go so far. And I think we all now know that, you know, living through a pandemic without diagnostic means having no control and an unbearable really amount of anxiety with no clear horizon for hope. And this is a very scary place to be when you have type one diabetes. So I think, you know, it's, it's so important, you know, to have those glycemic tools there in the first place and to, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into discussion later on, on how we can encourage governments and the the private sector and other actors within civil society to get there. But I, I'm going to bang this drum again, that to get good glycemic control, we need to pull levers that facilitate access to, to glucose monitoring tools. Absolutely. And I love that analogy you've drawn of insulin being the TV and testing being the remote, because that also helps people not living with diabetes understand how integrally they relate to each other, but like a new TV that doesn't have an on off button that can only work with the remote. <laughs> Dr. Slammer, could you speak to us about why these four targets are so important to improve the lives of people living with diabetes? Well, everything we do start with the people at the center. So I think uh, what Emma just illustrated is that uh, in order to be able to carve a global response, a national response, uh, we need to understand first uh, what, what are the needs? And from a scientific point of view, and you have seen from, from Ed's uh, uh, statements, is that there are a number of elements that constitute effective care. And I think whether from a clinical perspective, from a people-centered perspective, there are, I mean, in those targets are important entry point to define how we live and maintain a life without complication, without uh, morbidity from a national or, or, or program monitoring perspective, but at the center is really people that are still active, can participate in the society, as Emma mentioned, without the fear that you don't have access to medicine or diagnostic tools. So what I would like to see in this discussion on, on the targets, the target, we propose them as an entry point. Uh, but as you have seen, the recommendation were on strengthening national diabetes response that we have submitted to the executive board and the vision of the compact goes beyond the target, but in, in understanding that these are important entry point for driving quality improvement specifically on diabetes care. But I think there are uh, other elements within the dialogue that we have with our member state, with stakeholders uh, and communities around how we improve diabetes prevention and care. And I have seen in the chat a lot of comment on prevention, on uh, uh, education, all those elements are here. I mean, of course, we are discussing here mainly the, the focus is on the target. I think the target are important drivers uh, and are, are focusing the action on specific element where we see that there might be an improvement and um, somehow a, a move from the trajectories because at the end of the day, all our objective is to make sure that countries and uh, population um, in terms of mortality are on track uh, to reach the SDG and they're clearly not at the moment. But I think this has to go with improvement at the level of people first, but also at the level of countries that they can report at the global level. And I think this is where mm -hmm. the target can guide those actions. Thank you, Dr. Slammer. Prof Raposa, do you have anything else to add? Why these four targets are important to improve the lives of people mm -hmm. living with diabetes? 
Yes, I hope you can hear me because I'm with poor connection now. I don't know exactly why, but it happens. So. We can hear, no problem. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. So just going on, on the comment that Dr. Slama has just made it, I think we must be careful not to just focus on these targets, but to check what are they for? Because we can use it in many different ways. And we know that diabetes care is just not about governments. It's just not about health policies in global, but it's also about the civil society involvement. That's why IDF is also representing here. And I'm part of a APDP, the Portuguese Diabetes Association, but it's about also individual involvement. And it's good to have some leads to the society to say, okay, we should fight for a common goal like these ones, but these are not the only ones. And I fully agree with most of the discussion that we can see on the chat, but we have to have a common ground to discuss, to do a kind of market share for and we know that's, that's usually not so fair for most of us, but it's we should start that discussion and we should have tools for that discussion. And we should commit all the society for that kind of global target to have better care for people living with diabetes. Otherwise, we know that diabetes represents that threat that all of us know so well. And we know also that that's not just that what we are discussing here, it's only a part of the burden caused by diabetes. We are not discussing many other dimensions of the burden caused by diabetes. I think we are all aware of that. We, are, we try to simplify this approach here, but even so, as Professor Greg has said, it's quite ambitious, and, but we should have these and, and they are really important. And just a short comment on, uh, on the target on hypertension, because mm -hmm. For many, many years, the diabetes community has been focused on glycemia, and that's still very, very important. And then we start that discussion saying that diabetes is just not the glucocentric approach. It's more, much more than that. And the cardiovascular risk and target organs are really important on diabetes. Uh, and so the reason for the numbers being so different, probably between the glycemic control and hypertension control, it's also because of the awareness of the relevance of having this target control for people living with diabetes. And for mm -hmm. that, it just means again, for governments and for the health facilities, they should have a more defined target for hypertension, probably that for the glycemic control, because we are losing lives of people. We are losing quality of mm -hmm. life. We don't deal with statins and with blood pressure control. Great, thank you. So interesting to, to have to consider. It's, it's like holding all the different puzzle pieces at once, isn't it? Um, Dr. Perfect. Riley, a question for you, please, from our audience. Shouldn't targets be tailored to countries' capacities to meet targets? I think high-income countries can assure more than 60% of people treated for diabetes aged 40 or older are receiving statins. Yeah, great question. Um, I, I think we want to stress that these are you know, a global targets. Um, so we strongly encourage countries to consider developing national targets based on their own national situation and build on these uh, global targets for, for coverage. So the national targets could, could be more or less ambitious than the global ones um, when you take into account the national adaptation that, uh, that could be done. And that, that would be guided by the current level of prevention and management of diabetes, the current levels of mortality, the current levels of risk exposure in the population, um, and, uh, and what are the planned um, programs and activities. So, um, so we want to encourage this flexible approach, because as you say, it really does depend a little bit on national situations, but we wanted to peg where we think most countries' ambition should be. And as, um, as Ed stated at the beginning, these are ambitious but achievable um, mm -hmm. with investment and support and, uh, and action. And we really want to encourage countries to, to move towards those. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. And I think that's also what's, what's helpful to look at these targets as a focusing tool. We're not saying this is it and everyone has to only meet these. We're saying let's focus on achieving this and then Maybe it's done in two years' time and the, and the target can get greater. So I want us to move on to talking um, about target five because it's a very important one. Um, but I just want to acknowledge all the questions that keep flooding in. We, we really appreciate the incredible engagement that's happening here. So we're going to go through a few questions for target five and 
try and include as many of your questions to our experts as possible. I particularly enjoy putting people on the spot, so this is great fun for me. So target five is 100% of people with type 1 diabetes have access to affordable insulin treatment and blood glucose self-monitoring. Ms. Clayton, do we know how many people with type 1 diabetes don't get diagnosed? I know this is something that Life for a Child is very passionate about. Yes, yes, we are. And um, I'll, I'll kind of revert to, to what I said initially about target number one, because I think targets one and five are, are quite linked. Um, I think it, it, you know, I'll repeat again that it's fair to say that we think non-diagnosis rates could be as high as 50% in some low uh, income countries. Um, but we're extremely excited for uh, the launch of the T1D index, which will be such a novel tool in, in the first of its kind and, and so rich in data um, to be able to, to um, you know, expand upon this. And I think, you know, with this information now known, I think, I think governments have such a moral obligation and uh, the, the private sector as well are under a moral obligation. We have thought that we've sort of known what the numbers are, but when we really know and when we really push those numbers out there, I just, I just think the possibilities could be immense there, but it's about really building bridges there between advocates and those who are change makers within countries and, and having, you know, many seats at many different tables being filled to, to facilitate those bridges. Thank you so much. And, and seeing as we're talking specifically about top one here, could you give just a one or two line intro of what the T1D index is for those who don't know? Um, sure, I can. Um, maybe uh, Professor Stephen will, will like to say a little bit more about this, but this is sort of the first of its kind where data will be available on those living with type 1 diabetes in all countries at various age ranges. Um, and it is an immense tool that is building on, you know, all of uh, adding to all of the rich epidemiological data that already exists. Um, but I think particularly, you know, we'll be able to drill down into that country specific and age specific data. And I think one of the most compelling aspects of, of the index to me is um, communicating how many people should be alive with type one diabetes if you know an intermediate level of care were to be achieved within country. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the members of our community here was talking about um, misdiagnosis and, and how getting the right diagnosis is difficult. Um, they said, I would really like to know and see an estimate of how many people with diabetes are misdiagnosed with type two and later diagnosed with type one or another form of, of diabetes. Prof. Raposa, could you speak to this? Well, I, I can try because there are some publications uh, made on that, but it's also a tough question because it really depends and we are discussing access to medication, access to testing, but this is access to diagnostic tools. This misdiagnose between type two and type one diabetes means that a part of a highly suspicious clinical uh, from the clinical suspicion from the doctor, we, are, mm -hmm. we have to have access to laboratory tests measuring autoimmunity, antibodies, other kind of tests. And we have just anecdotal data throughout the world saying that perhaps 20, 25, 30% of the people diagnosed with type 2 diabetes might have type 1 diabetes. Why is that so relevant? Well, for it's the label that's also important and it's access to treatments because it's access to the better treatment at an early stage and that can make a difference. And nowadays we have quite different tools for type one and type two diabetes. And that's why it's so relevant to have that discussion. And again, discussing not just access to treatment but access to proper diagnostic tools that are still needed in many, many countries all around the world. Mm. Thank you, thank you very much. Speaking of the right tools for the, for the right kind of diabetes, do we know how many people diagnosed with type one diabetes don't get access to affordable insulin treatment and blood glucose self-monitoring? Ms. Payton? 
So I will start by saying that, you know, access to care in high income countries is not a completely solved issue. There is always more work to be done. There will always be communities that are struggling to access the care that they have the right to access. But I will start by saying that access to to test strips and in particularly is usually not so much of a problem in high income countries. Um, But to your question, I think the short answer, at least for LMICs in our view, is that the majority of people just can't afford care uh, when it's not reliably provided by governments. And, And this is particularly the case for test strips. They are simply cost prohibitive for those living with type 1 diabetes and their families to to be able to afford to purchase out of pocket. And so why do I say out of pocket, for instance? Well, this is because, you know, while some universal health coverage programs within LMICs provide basic insulins within the health system's benefits package, This is hardly ever the case for a provision of glucose monitoring supplies, you know, the the test strips. And I can recall a survey we conducted a couple of years ago, which which showed over half of the LMICs surveyed um, their national health systems provided some form of insulin, but for test strips, this was around 10% um, of, of the countries providing. And, and even at that low rate, uh, those, those countries providing test strips only provide you know, two, two or less test strips a day. And that isn't to say that you can't achieve good um, glycemic outcomes from you know, fewer test strips a day than you might think, but less than two per day is, is not sufficient. Um, and, and, and for some some more context, I'd, I'd just like to say that we, we have carried out research on the costs of test strips um, as a percentage of GDP, for instance, and found the mean to be about 40% across LMICs. Um, and this ranged to even over 100% in some West and Central African nations. So back to your question, I think on the whole, test strips are usually the largest cost to households uh, in LMICs for type 1 diabetes care and can in some cases be completely cost restrictive for families. Thank you. If we look um, back to you, Ms. Begum, and and the situation in Bangladesh, um, how many people receive treatment for type 1 diabetes and how many receive treatment for type 2 diabetes? Do you have those figures? Uh, well, um, in Bangladesh, actually, uh, this is a government uh, policy that no one should uh, be out of uh, this insulin uh, taking facility for type 1 uh, diabetes. So it is actually 100% we can say that everyone is getting free insulin for type 1 diabetes. And for type 2, actually, uh, I don't have a um, like a number in my hand and the, at this moment, but uh, for the diabetes, we have uh, like diabetes uh, association and other hospital facilities. So wow. there are a lot of, uh, first of all, we have this uh, testing facility everywhere. And then uh, they come under the treatment facility from tertiary level to the uh, periphery level. And we have like 14,000 peripheral uh, community clinics. And uh, from all the clinics everywhere, uh, the people comes with any other complications, they go for diabetes test, sugar and blood pressure test first, and then they go for other treatments. So in this way, they are covered by the, uh, you know, our facilities. Perfect, thank you. Um, Prof. Raposa, I've been asking you a lot of difficult questions. I thought I would ask you an easy one. Why is this target important for the type 1 diabetes community? Well, it, it, it's important because it, it's a life saving measure, mm-hmm. uh, and that's as easy to explain as that. And just adding one comment to the, what we have just been hearing, I think when we're speaking about diabetes, we usually present those huge numbers that we have just started today in this meeting. And, and I think governments and health systems are always afraid when speaking about any kind of measure to tackle diabetes. 
And when we're speaking about type 1 diabetes, and that's why I think it's important to have that, that target for type 1 diabetes very, very objective here, because we are speaking in a huge number of people living with diabetes. We're thinking about 5% of people, 10% of people. And actually, and I think it was Mrs. Platman that was just speaking about the cost of this. It's mm -hmm. most of the time, it's not so relevant as when we are addressing measures for type 2 diabetes, and we should also address those kind of measures because it's not so expensive. It's cost effective. And if you just see if it's life saving, it just means everything. And it's life saving, just not for young children. It's like saving for young, uh, youngsters, adults. So we are speaking about the active part of the population. So when we are dealing in nowadays economy, it's all around us. So it's it's one of the best investments that you can do. It's for sure here, it's no discussion on that. And that's so relevant for people living also with type one diabetes for their families, when they don't mm -hmm. have to be confronted with not being able to provide the best care for people living with diabetes. We as a, a part of the civil society, again, a part of the health society, we cannot accept this. So countries are really, obliged to have that in their minds and provide the best care for those people also. Mm, agreed. And um, I want to address one of one of the big questions now. What do governments, private sector and civil society need to do to help achieve these targets by 2030? I think it's a big question, so I'm going to ask a, a couple of people to, to address it from different elements. Dr. Slammer, would you like to start? Yeah, of course, easy question to answer in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, and <laughs> no, I think uh, they are they are important uh, element, but I think we need we need we all have a role first of all, and the way you have addressed the question is that it's addressing different target population. And I think we need to recognize that there is um, respective uh, responsibilities in who is doing what. The first is really what we would like to achieve with our member states is to raise the uh, the attention on diabetes as part of the NCD agenda at the highest level, so that. Basically, what we are asking for is that diabetes should receive that attention in universal health coverage. What does it mean? Availability of services of good quality without financial uh, catastrophe. And what Emma and all the colleagues have mentioned today, we would like to make sure that those preventive, but also, I mean, curative services across a continuum of care, people-centered, integrated, are there as part of the service delivery bundle of services that are offering to a population. This is a journey. Not all countries start at the same baseline, and we need to work with countries in building that agenda. But we start somewhere with a common vision. This is what we bring with that level of discussion at the World Health Assembly and with the compact. And then we bring all the people, starting with the people themselves. I think you have seen it with the, the stronger so, um, participation of uh, people living with diabetes across this year with us. I think it was a very good illustration that uh, nothing on us without us. I think it's something that we wanted to walk the talk and at all levels. Yeah. The last point is really I wanted to share because we many of those targets are related to access to medicine. I've seen some of the chat. Access to medicine is a crowded space in global health and we have the pharmaceutical sector and this is where the dialogue that we have with non-state actors, but also the private sector companies, specifically on the value chain for medicine, but also for diagnostic tools, what would have an impact in reduction of the price on the availability and affordability across countries? We dissect this by NCD medicine. It's the same for diabetes. We started with insulin, with all uh, 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 drugs, but also the, um, the diagnostic technologies. And we look at those dimensions from pool procurement, pre-qualification, all the elements that would have an impact on the availability and affordability. And we have specific asks to the private sector, and we try to move on that. So I think we all have a role, but we need, I say, to frame the question about what we expect from the various uh, contributors and stakeholders. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Clayton, do you have anything to add on, on what governments, private sector, and civil society need to do to help? So I'll come at this um, from particularly from ensuring diagnosis and ensuring uh, good glycemia. So I'll come at I'll come at your question from those two angles. And I think to to ensure that those two targets are met, I think 
the multi-stakeholder community, particularly governments and, and the private sector, need to ensure that people living with at least type 1 diabetes, and, and I am coming from a type 1 diabetes and, and young person angle here, I just will disclose that, we need to ensure that they have affordable access to glucose monitoring tools in the first place, as I've said. And, and, and as I've mentioned, currently, most health systems do not adequately provide strips. And I think also to, to the community, I think even when test strips are provided, they must be supplemented by not just good, but empowering education from empathetic healthcare professionals who, who meet them where they're at. There are so many different types of communities living with type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is not just the only common thread here. There are various communities who, who deserve to be met where they're at. And so I think we need a real effort from governments to start procuring test strips for all in need and glucose monitoring manufacturers to enable affordable purchase. And, and I'd like to also say this is where I think information is so important. Um, civil society are, are doing a lot in this space, and I think governments truly need to know how many people need to be monitoring to be able to forecast. And I, and I think this is where the T1D index will be tremendously helpful here. Mm -hmm. And to hit this home, I, I would say to, to, this, to the global community, I, I strongly advocate for test strips to be seen. Um, at, as just essential as, as insulin here. And for anyone listening who thinks test strips are the second port of call after insulin for those living with type 1 diabetes, uh, I'm going to be strong and say that I, I believe that's wrong. The two are simply inextricably linked. And if we're serious about helping people with type 1 diabetes in LMIC achieve good glycemia, levers need to be pulled. And, and I, this is why I feel excited about, you know, Slim mentioning the possibilities for pre-qualification and pooled procurement in this area. Um, and I would even go as far as far to say that test strip should, should be viewed um, as a medicine for people living with type one diabetes. Mm -hmm. Just Thank insulin you. alone is not going to get get people good glycemia and neither is just the existence of monitoring supplies alone. Education is key here too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Prof. Greg, just in case you thought um, your job is over, we have a very difficult question for you from the community. Why isn't type 2 diabetes, including access to oral medicines, included in Target Live? Well, I think an important point underlying this whole discussion here is that these five targets are not the only things we should be going after. You know, diabetes is a multi-level, multi-component problem, um, wherein we need to think about a full range from prevention all the way to prevention of, compl prevention of the condition to prevention of the complications. There are many targets that we don't have here. I think that actually getting, you know, assuring medication delivery is, is certainly an important target. The key thing here is that the compact is about selecting five big ones that we can focus on, that if we change these five, we're going to make a big difference in, in health outcomes for people with diabetes. In the meantime, though, you know, at the beginning of the session, Leanne talked about measurement driving action. And I think that ideally we should also think about measurement at other levels in terms of the way care is delivered, medications are delivered, prevention. Um, there's, there's lots of other aspects. So I think it's really important that we, um, over the long term, think about measuring, measurement driving action across a wider range than these five targets. But for now, we want to, we really want to focus on these five. Great, thank you. And Dr. Ali, I have one more for you um, from our community. Why do these five targets only focus on coverage and not address type two diabetes prevention at all? I know prevention was, was being talked about a lot in the chat. Yeah, so I did want to address that because I think perhaps we're talking about these as if they're so new and just remind people that actually back in 2013, the World Health Assembly adopted a set of NCD targets, nine global targets that addressed some, they were tracer targets, but they did address some of the key prevention oriented indicators um, and targets for, for diabetes. So this uh, target around halting the rise in uh, obesity, 
Um, there are targets um, related to promoting um, physical activity and reducing insufficient physical activity. So some of those prevention components were already addressed, very risk factor focused in 2013. And what we see here is now a sort of an extension to look at, you know, at a more granular level around coverage of treatment and care, which I think complement and support the targets that have actually been around for, well, it's a decade almost, yeah. So it, it, it's not... It's not ignored, um, it actually came first, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. On that note, I'm gonna thank all the panelists so much for, for all your wisdom and sharing um, of your knowledge for us and for being put on the spot so many times. Um, just to round up, let me read the targets one more time. 80% of people with diabetes are diagnosed. 80% of people diagnosed have a good control of glycemia. 80% of people diagnosed have a good control of blood pressure. 60% of people with diabetes over 40 years or older receive statins, and 100% of people with type 1 diabetes have access to affordable insulin treatment and blood glucose self-monitoring. And um, I, I want to reiterate that the whole diabetes community and the IDF are here to support WHO in these targets and to support member states in being able to achieve them. So now I just want to make a couple of closing comments. Thank you so much to everyone. You're allowed switching your cameras off. Um, I think this was such a fascinating discussion because these proposed targets are feasible, right? They're feasible and they're realistic. It's not that we're aiming for something that's impossible to get. Um, what, do, what are they called? Ambitious, but realistic. And we know that targets alone aren't enough, as we've heard today from, from all these speakers, but they are an essential step. I think the important thing to, to point out here is that if diabetes is prioritized, these are feasible and realistic targets. And, and that's really the change that we want to communicate. In the first WHO Global Diabetes Compact last year, the word patient was discussed and, and how we don't want to use it to describe people with diabetes. And I remember so clearly one of the advocates, uh, Renza Shabilia from Australia, saying something that has stuck with me ever since. She said, patience is not a virtue when it comes to the rights of people with diabetes. I think we've been very patient thus far. It's, it's 2022 and we don't yet have diabetes targets and it's time to change that. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Um, this has been such a fascinating hour and a half. Don't worry if, if you feel like it's all flown by, that's how I feel. The recording and slides and a feedback questionnaire will be sent to all of you in a few days time. Please respond to the feedback questionnaire. It's, it's to help us improve future IDF online events. And if you have any questions about this or about diabetes advocacy in general, please email advocacy at idf.org. And once more, huge thanks. We have had some amazing speakers and panelists today. Thank you all for giving up your time uh, to be with us. And thank you to the more than 500 people. I think we were over 500 for the whole webinar. Thank you all for, for giving of your time and spending time with us today. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>